Welcome to another Advent of Code walkthrough video. Today we'll be looking at 2022 day 14. So our distress signal leads us to a giant waterfall. The signal seems like it's coming from behind the waterfall, and that doesn't really make sense. But you do notice a little path that leads behind the waterfall. So correction, the distress signal actually leads you behind a giant waterfall. And there's a large cave system here, and the signal leads further inside. As you make your way deeper underground, you notice the ground rumbling and sand begins pouring in. If you don't figure out where the sand's going, you might become trapped. But fortunately, you are very familiar with analyzing the path of falling materials. This is a reference to 2018 Day 17, where we had a very similar problem. Um, not quite the same, but quite similar. So you have a two-dimensional uh, two vertical slice of the cave above you, and discover that it's mostly air with some structures made out of rock. And your scan traces the path of each solid rock structure and reports the x, y coordinates that form the shape, where x is the distance to the right and y is the distance downwards. So x is the column and y is the row. Each path is a single line of text in your scan. The first point in the path indicates the end of a straight horizontal or vertical line to be drawn, and the second one is the other end point. So do note that this means that between each pair of inputs here, one of the coordinates is going to be the same. So you don't have to worry about diagonal lines. All of your lines are either horizontal or vertical here. So this scan here, the test input, indicates that we have two paths. The first one has two straight lines, and the second one has three straight lines. The first one consists of a line of rock from the coordinates 4984 through 4986, and this is inclusive, so that would be uh, 4984, which is here, or sorry, here, and 4986, which is here. So that would be this vertical here. And then we go from 4986 to 4966, which would be this line. And then the second one starts at 5034 and goes left to 5024, then goes all the way down to 5029, and then goes left to 4949. Sand is produced one unit at a time, starting from the point 500 to zero. And once a unit of sand appears, the next one isn't produced until the previous one comes to rest, so you only need to consider these one at a time. A unit of sand will take the following steps. If possible, it will fall down one step, straight down. If the tile below is blocked, either there's rock there or there's already sand, then the unit of sand will attempt to go diagonally one step down and to the left. If that's also blocked, then it will try to move one step down diagonally and to the right. It will keep moving as long as it's able to, and once all three spots below it, both directly and diagonally, are blocked, then it will stop. So the first unit of sand drops directly down to 508, the second one drops to 507, and then because it can move to the left, it does so. The third unit will go to the right, the fourth unit will stay on top, the fifth unit will land on top of that and then go down diagonally once, and then go down diagonally again, and so on and so forth. So this is what it will look like after 22 units of sand. Two more units can come to rest here and here, and then beyond that, if any more sand is created, it will fall off the bottom into the abyss. So the tildes here trace the path of that particular uh, sand grain. It will just fall off the, uh, below the bottom and continue indefinitely. So the problem statement asks, given your scan, how many units of sand can come to rest before it starts flowing into the abyss? So this is a perfect uh, situation for complex numbers. So let's first begin by parsing. So the input format today is not too bad to parse. Um, this is an example where I might recommend using regex to just grab the uh, list of integers directly. However, it doesn't seem like it would actually save that much here. So just to make things more readable, I'll just parse this the normal way. So we first want to think about how we want to go about representing our state. So we don't actually need a grid because we're not actually looking around the grid. We just need to know for a particular coordinate is it free or not? So we can represent this by a set of all filled coordinates. So let's call it B for blocked, 
will start out as the empty set. Now for each line of input, we will first trim it to get rid of this trailing new line, and then we'll split it on space dash right arrow space. So that will give us our list of pairs where each pair is still a string. So we'll take that, and then we'll use a list comprehension to get it into the actual numbers. So for each pair in this, we can take pair, split it by the comma, and then map the int function over it to cast it into an integer. So if we print out all of these and just run this on our test um, input, we get the appropriate lists of pairs. Now we just need to go through each consecutive pair. So we can, what we can do is this, for i in range length x minus 1, we take xi and xi plus 1 to be our pair. So this loops the index from the first space up until the second last space, um, and then takes that value and the one to its right. To be a bit shorter, you can also do this for a, b, and zip x with x, uh, with the first value removed. Um, just as a recap of what that does, if you have a list, then a with a slice starting at 1 and ending at none uh, cuts off the first value, basically. And zip will take t any number of iterables and sort of go column-wise. So if we turn this into a list, you see that we get the consecutive pairs. And this is because we've cut off the first value from the second one. So we have a list 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and a list 2, 3, 4, 5. So when we zip them together column-wise, we get 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 5. And then the first list has the 5 at the end, but the second list is empty, so we stop. And then to use unpacking either in further, we can do for x1, x2, uh, sorry, x1, y1, and then x2, y2, like so because a and b were pairs of integers, and so we can unpack them like this to very quickly read out our values. So this is the sort of optimization that's probably not necessarily the best way to do things just because it can be hard to read, but when writing the AOC, it can save you quite a bit of time to do stuff like this. So now we want to do a range, but we can't just directly loop from x1 to, uh, x1 to x2, because they could be in different orders. So we saw with our example input that here the x value is actually decreasing, here the x value is also decreasing, here the y value is increasing, so it's not consistent. But that's not a problem, we can just sort them. So x1, x2 equals sorted x1, x2. This just takes x1 and x2, sorts them, which will return a list of length 2 with them in order, and then we unpack them back to x1 and x2. Now x1 and x2 might be equal to each other, but that means that this operation doesn't do anything. And it's not inefficient to do this. Um, technically, it would waste time compared to doing like x1 equals min and x2 equals max, but um, the overhead really isn't very significant for inputs of this size. So now we run our loop for x in range x1 to x2 plus 1. Recall that range stops before the specified stop value. So if we want it to include it, then we need to add 1. For y in range y1, y2 plus 1. So this fills in a rectangle, but because either x's are equal or the y's are equal, the rectangle just becomes a line. Then we can just add our value. So we're not going to add the pair x, y into our set. We're going to work with complex numbers. So first we need to figure out which way we're going to specify this. So like, is the row the real component or is the column? We will define the x value to be real and the y value to be imaginary. This is a completely arbitrary decision. You could do it the other way. B dot add x plus y times 1j. So this will make a complex number with real component x and imaginary component y. Now we also want to keep track of what the lowest point is. The reason for that is because if sand goes below the bottommost rock formation, then that means that there can't be anything blocking it below, so that's where it enters the abyss. 
So we're going to call it abyss, and we're going to start it off at zero. And each time we see a larger y value, we'll increase the abyss. So abyss equals max of the current abyss and y plus one. So y is the uh, actual vertical location of the bottommost rock formation. So we'll add one to that. So if sand reaches the abyss, then we can stop. So now we should have our set containing our uh, rocks. So these are the coordinates of all of our rock points. Now we can start simulating the sand. So let's keep track of how many uh, sand particles came to rest. So we'll do t equals zero for total. And now while true, we're going to generate a new sand particle at 500 zero, which is 500 plus zero j, so just 500. And now we will simulate its movement. So we'll run another while loop inside to keep dropping the sand as long as we can. So if it can fall straight down, and straight down is an increase in y, so an increase in the complex component, if s plus 1j is not in b, so if it is not blocked off, then s plus equals 1j, and we continue. If s plus 1j minus 1, so that's down 1 and then to the left 1, is not in b, s plus equals 1j minus 1, and continue. If s plus 1j plus 1 not in b, then s plus equals 1j plus 1, and continue. At this point, our sand can no longer fall any further. We've tried all three possibilities, and so it comes to rest. And to make it come to rest, we just add it into our blocked set to indicate that it's now here. And then we can also increase t by 1 to represent that this sand has stopped. So now we just need to find the condition to break out of this loop. Um, sorry, there should be a breakdown here, actually. Now we just need to find a condition to break out of this loop. So if at any point our sand drops below the abyss, this loop will keep running indefinitely. And so we need to find a way to break out of this loop. So we'll add a check at the top. If the imaginary component of s, which is the y value, is ever greater than or equal to the abyss, remember that zero is at the top, so it needs to be greater than or equal to the abyss, then we can't just say break, because that will exit this loop, but then it won't exit this loop. So instead, we're actually just going to use exit zero to completely kill the program. And here, we're just going to print out the number of particles of sand that came to rest. And we get 24 for the sample input and 715 for our actual input. So this is honestly a relatively straightforward simulation problem. Really, all you need to do is parse the input, get it into some format, and I strongly recommend using a set. Doing this as a grid would be a pain because you need to f expand the grid to the right size, which can cause a lot. It's very easy to make bugs with that. But because you're not actually checking the grid, you're just checking if a coordinate is filled, you can use a set of filled coordinates instead. Oh, and if, you're, um, if you ever need to do something grid-like, but there are multiple states, not just an on or off, you can just convert this into a dictionary and map each coordinate to its value. It's technically not as efficient as a grid for large inputs, but generally speaking, it should be good enough. Using complex numbers here was just to save us a bit of time. It is very convenient, but it's completely unnecessary. Um, you could have just done b dot add x, y, and then here we can just do s equals 500, 0. And then we can do like if s is 0, s1 plus 1 not in b, then we can do like s1 plus equals 1, etc. So it is fine to not use complex numbers. It saves you a bit of time. Um, overall, it doesn't really matter too much, but a couple of seconds saved here and there can matter for the top of the leaderboard. So I always use complex numbers in situations like this where it works nicely. And moving on to the second part, you realize you misread the scan. There isn't an endless void at the bottom, there's actually the floor, and you are standing on the floor. You don't have time to scan the floor, so you assume that the floor is an infinite horizontal line with y coordinate equal to 2 plus the highest y coordinate. So in other words, there is a gap below the lowest rock formation, and then it is immediately the floor. So this is what our example looks like. 
Find, to find somewhere safe to stand, you'll need to simulate falling sand until the unit of sand comes to rest. So you can assume that 500 zero is like a hole with sand flowing out of it. Once a unit of sand has come to rest at 500 zero, then no more sand can be produced. And so at that point, the sand will stop moving entirely. And so the question now asks, how many units of sand come to rest before this happens? We can repurpose this code very quickly. It took me only about a minute to go from part one to part two, because the way my co uh, logic was set up worked basically perfectly. Abyss was the layer right below the last rock. So it is now the layer right above the floor. In other words, if the sand reaches the abyss, it stops. So we're, instead of adding the floor, because then we'd have to like hope that we don't add too few values and have the floor not wide enough, if the imaginary value of s is greater than or equal to the abyss, um, in fact, they can only equal the abyss because we only increase the imaginary value by one at a time, then instead of exiting, we're just going to mark it as stopped. So break, or sorry, um, b dot add We'll move the uh, b dot add s and t plus equals one thing outside of the inner loop. Uh, this works the same. It just avoids us having to copy paste this code up here. So now instead of stopping when sand reaches the abyss, the abyss now represents the last layer above the floor. And so when sand reaches that layer, it can't possibly fall down because of the floor. And so we stop it there. And now we just change the outer true condition to 500 not in B. So, so long as 500 is not blocked off, where again, 500 represents the pair 500 zero, we keep running simulations of sand until eventually a sand particle is generated, it cannot fall down and it immediately comes to rest and puts 500 into B, which causes this to exit. And so now we just move our print T to the end, which represents the total number of particles of sand that came to rest. And we get our answers of 93, and 25,248. So honestly, all around, not an extremely difficult problem. It was relatively straightforward, just simulation. There were a couple of tricks here and there that you can use to speed up how fast you write your solution. But I personally found this challenge of fairly nice difficulty and it was pretty fun to code. So that's all for today's video. Um, I hope you enjoyed and learned something and I'll see you tomorrow for day 15.